Hi, everybody. My name is Damon Manning. I'm alumni. I'm from the class of uh, 1995. Today I'm talking to you about the Oyster Wars, so you guys can start the slides. And the slides aren't really going to follow what I'm going to say today. They're from a, a different discussion that's a, a lot longer than I have today, so try not to pay too much attention to them. <laughs> So the summer before last, I was, I was looking for a topic to, to write my capstone on, and I was at the uh, Captain Salem Avery Museum in Shadyside, Maryland. And I came across this really neat article from 1888 about the Maryland Oyster Navy. And, and they, they were describing a battle on the Choptank River where this, this, the Maryland Oyster Naval boat, which was outfitted with a howitzer cannon on its bow, um, was whooped by a bunch of fishermen in canoes with muskets. And I thought that was kind of extraordinary, considering during that era there was no law enforcement agencies like we have today. There are no police forces. The, uh, the counties might have had a, a justice of the peace. If they were lucky, they had a sheriff. But for the most part, law enforcement was left up to the local militias. So the idea that they created a police force just to protect a crusty old uh, bivalve was, was interesting. I thought I had a great topic, and I said, wow, Maryland, Maryland was, was way ahead of everybody else. They, they were creating the first environmental protection uh, agency, in a way. Um, so I started digging and digging, and, and I didn't find much in the way of prim uh, secondary resources. Most, what little I did find kind of characterized the wars on the Chesapeake as a battle over diminishing resources. Um, a classic example of Garrett Hardwin's tragedy of the commons. Um, but when I looked into the primary resources at the Maryland archives and through historical newspapers, government publications, and memoirs from the era, um, the story became a little different. Um, so during that time, when those oyster codes were created, it was just at the close of the, the Civil War, there were a lot of men returning from the Civil War to find that their soil was exhausted for tobacco farming, um, their slaves were set free, the economy was sort of in chaos. Um, the one part of the state that was actually doing well was, was the Chesapeake Bay, the Tidewater area, the communities around the bay. They were, um, they were benefiting from a, a spike in the demand of protein. For somehow, all the oyster beds in Europe and even in New England had been exhausted at this point. Railway, road, road building, and, and population expansion had just created this, this demand for protein. So the bay was almost the last man standing. They were supplying, and throughout the, the latter half of the, the 19th century, 40% of the globe's um, seafood. So the governor at the time, Thomas Swan, who was behind creating the Oyster Navy and the Oyster Codes, was a former slaveholder. He was not a native to Maryland. The former slaveholder from Virginia who came in, married into an aristocratic Baltimore family, and immediately got into politics. And so he saw his job as restoring Maryland to a white man's government. And he saw this economic opportunity. He said, there's this demand for protein um, Every, everybody else is wiped out, and we've got this, we've got this bay with all these oysters. Um, and so he created laws that were aimed not, and the oyster codes and the, the navy, not really to protect the oysters, but, but more to destabilize the region and push African Americans out of that area. And he did that with um, the, 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 the oyster code. And what, it, what this oyster code did was for the first time in history during this, um, Maryland had written four constitutions at this point. All of them had guaranteed that every Maryland had, Marylander had the right to, to oyster. Thomas Swan changed that and said, if you wanted to oyster in the Bay, you, you needed a license. You needed to indicate what your race was and display your registration numbers in odd various places. There was a lot of literacy during this period. And he deputized only white men to enforce these codes. All white men, whether you are law enforcement or not, militia or not, you were officially a deputy on the Chesapeake Bay, allowed to enforce the Oyster Code. 
and employ posse comitatus. You could even, if you found an oyster violator who might have had their registration number in the wrong place or the wrong size letters, he was allowed to, after he caught that, that man, he was allowed to um, auction off his property, his boat, his fishing equipment, and take a quarter of the uh, property himself. The other three quarters of the property went to the state. And this was perpetrated you know, solely on African Americans. Um, and so it, this was essentially one of the first I don't know, culture wars. And Governor Swan said, was open. He said he was doing this to promote um, white labor. So when you're looking at the, the, the spikes in violence on the Chesapeake Bay, the oyster population in the Bay doesn't start to decline until the 18, uh, late 1890s. But the peaks of the, the violence on the Chesapeake started to uh, rise in the 1770s and peaked in the 1880s. And the violence was, was not just perpetrated mostly against African Americans, but but all immigrants, German, um, a lot of German immigrants. And they were used, it was, they employed a, a different type of slavery um, to harvest these oysters. And um, so it was sad because what I thought, ultimately I thought I had a, a thesis where I was going to describe an, uh, a period where we were protecting the oysters and it turned out to be a period where the, they used the law to, not, not for preservation, but, but instigation. Um, I'm sorry, am I out of time? Sorry. That, that's it.